The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, depending on where and when you're watching this. This webinar is also not a webinar because it's live streaming on a number of different channels. So we're trying something different for fun. You might be watching in the traditional way through the GoToWebinar and registration as a webinar. You might be watching this after December the 15th on an on-demand basis or you might be watching live on your favorite streaming channel. And all of those things are gonna give you the same fun experience. So I'm joined by my fun colleague, Dory Malouf. Dory, welcome to the webinar slash live stream. Welcome, Bob, and welcome to everyone out there. Um, happy holidays to everyone, and look forward to a fun conversation about 2023. It's fast approaching. It is fast approaching and it is almost the holidays. We are definitely wearing our festive green and red. I noticed that I'm not. <laughs> I should have worn some sort of Christmas hat. Next webinar, I will do that. But for yeah. now, we will talk about the top five treasury practices that will change, change with dramatic effect your 2023. So in terms of what we wanted to go through, the order looks like this. We'll start by reviewing 2022. Yes, there are still 16 days left in 2022, maybe even less if you're watching later on demand. But uh, we will do a quick recapture of all the interesting things from a treasury perspective that really shaped what our practices and priorities are gonna be in 2023. We'll go through what we think are five very interesting practices. There was a lot to choose from, Dory. So coming down to this list was not a simple one. And maybe with your questions uh, during the presentation or at the end, certainly feel free to ask us about other things if there's others that are captivating your interest. But for now, we'll focus on real-time treasury, artificial intelligence, forecasting and spreadsheets, my favorite topic. I actually dealt with this, I guess it was last week in a webinar on cash forecasting where we talked about why does everyone hold on to their spreadsheets? There's really good reasons why people hold on to their spreadsheets. There's also equally good reasons why you might not have to in 2023. And then we'll talk about this emerging practice of liquidity planning, which seems to have all the buzzwords and all the attention in Treasury these days. And the last one, we're going to talk about value engineering, which is a practice that most people have fairly much figured out in the previous years. But the emphasis and importance has certainly changed going into next year, Dory, I think is a fair statement to make. Saving the best for last, right? <laughs> Always saving the best for last. And then there's the best, best for last, which is your questions. And we will address whenever you ask them. We'll address them all at the end and get through as many as we possibly can. But there's a lot to talk about. And it all starts with what changed in 2022? Well, a lot changed in 2022. I like this slide. I've used it in many a webinar. And the reason why is it kind of, well, it shows what led to what to what to what. In the end, we see impacts. The challenges that we have, I mean, just yesterday, December 14th, we saw another impact to interest rates. So we kind of see this continued effect. The expectation, I think, is that um, we are topping out or at least close to topping out in terms of interest rate increases. And that means that we now get to figure out what to do about it. Hopefully that means that the currency volatility maybe the headwinds as well, but certainly the currency volatility will calm down and that will make it a little bit easier to predict what next looks like. 
Next being, what does my forecast look like? What was my needs for liquidity? What are our different corporate actions we might take in terms of dealing with um, free cash flow? These are all sorts of discussions, Dory, that uh, a lot of organizations with a more settled uh, level of volatility are able to maybe catch up to. That's a fair statement. Yeah, it's a global impact. I mean, today the ECB raised a half point. Tomorrow we get the inflation numbers out of Europe. Uh, we got them uh, on the 13th here in the US, so slightly more, uh, less than expected. Uh, so more moderate inflation, uh, still 41 year high here in North America, but uh, there's a lot of impacts. There's a lot of impacts to corporates in all of these areas. In particular, when the cost of capital goes up, then you got to make up that cost somewhere else. So we'll be talking about that as we go through the presentation. Absolutely. So we've, I mean, we could spend, we could spend a long time this slide. We're not going to, because many of you who tune into webinars regularly will be familiar with this one. But let's talk about this one, Dory, because there's a couple of different data points here that I think are really quite relevant, probably not unfamiliar or unsurprising, but nonetheless, um, let's talk us through this, Dory. Yeah, I think what's interesting about this one is what happened in the first half of the year versus the last half of the year based on this Gartner uh, you know, survey. First half of the year, organizations were slightly less focused on automation or cutting costs. Uh, that's the first piece of the slide. You can see that when asked in the second half of the year as more pessimism uh, gains a footing tied to potential recession next year, there's a greater focus on automation. There's a greater focus on cutting costs. That's kind of the lead in that we talked about in the previous slide, right? Interest rates go up, cost of capital goes up, organizations have to make up the uh, the cost somewhere down the P&L. So how are they managing this? Well, they're trying to invest in the talent that they're going to retain, uh, and they're investing in technology because obviously technology helps you scale uh, when in times of uncertainty, helps you scale without any impact on overhead, and investing in the overhead that you are going to retain, that's going to be important long term. Uh, in the strategic positioning of the company in developing the organization's uh, overhead structure and making sure that it's set up for success continuously as we come out of what potentially could be a recession next year. All right, that's useful insight. So I think what we can take away primarily is that cutting costs is, let's just say an expectation that many have going into next year, but technology is the last to go. So equally important. All right. Now, in terms of trends, these are three things that I don't know if we necessarily started the year thinking these three things, but we certainly ended the year with these words. Every conversation that we have with CFOs and treasury teams, it tends to be these phrases are part of every single conversation. Liquidity planning, data and data analytics, and then this concept of operational resilience, which can mean a lot of different things, but Generally, when we're talking about it, it's how do I protect my income statement, balance sheet, and cash flows from these adverse effects? How can I ensure that I still have the same ability to generate cash, the same ability to meet those free cash flow targets that I had at the start of the year? Um, but Dory, what are your thoughts? I mean, we can read the bullet points, but what are your main thoughts in terms of the emergence of these, especially towards the back half of the year as we started to settle into a slightly challenged interest rate environment for many and certainly a more volatile currency market as the year went through. Yeah, it just harkens the need for everything is needed in terms of uh, reliability and timeliness yesterday, right? There's no longer uh, an expectation that, yeah, I'll, I'll provide you these insights, give me you know a couple days or give me a week to, to gather all the insights and give you what you need to make some sort of a decision. That's out the door. Right. Uh, information is needed in real time. Information is needed to be reliable. And, and that's what we're going to talk about throughout this webinar about how you get there. Right. How you get there from a liquidity planning and the data reliability. What the added layer to that is operational resilience. You may be expected to do more with less. Um, we haven't had too many organizations tell us that they are officially doing any cuts next year in the area of treasury and finance, but they are not saying that they're not either. 
So you want to make sure that you maintain that operational resilience uh, with less of overhead uh, on hand to manage what you need to manage day in and day out, what you need to block and tackle uh, to get things done that need to get done. Yeah, you know what I, to add on to that point, we did a, it was like a treasury and practice guide with AFP, I think it was in the summer, if I remember correctly, but it was certainly in the middle of last year or this past year, I should say. And one of the focuses of that was that as we, different external challenge, this was more focused on you know, great resignation and the challenges in maintaining uh, people and retaining them and, and that sort of thing, basically having enough people to do the job. And it was this focus on ensuring that you have business continuity, maybe similar external or similar dissimilar external factors, such as we may be budget challenged in 2023 and have to make tough decisions, hopefully not, but perhaps still that focus on business continuity treasury has to be done cash has to be managed you have to be able to forecast you have to be able to predict you have to ensure that whatever external factors are there are not inhibiting your ability to drive and generate cash which is as we know um, companies are being valued on their ability to generate cash the winners in equity markets are those that generate more cash than others not that that's a new concept, but the importance of the bottom part of the income statement versus the top has shifted certainly in the past year. Those organizations that can prove they can do, to your point, more with less are in a better pole position to emerge as winners. So there's a lot built into those statements that we'll dive into a little bit more. I definitely love the idea of liquidity planning and data analytics as coexisting. Those are important concepts which, spoiler alert, will show up in the next set of our slides. Before we go any further though, poll question, because we actually wanna know what's interesting to you. Uh, what has been your greatest challenge in 2022? You can select more than one of these. Uh, inflation, rise in interest rates, FX volatility, cash forecasting, or data analytics, like I was just hyping up a moment ago. Could be all of these things are challenging or have been challenging in the past year, Dory. It could be that there's one or two emerge. Not to lead the audience, we'll give them like 10 more seconds story, but any predictions <laughs> as to what yeah. you think might have been most challenging? We should have had an all the above here, right? You can select all of the above, it's okay, it's a lot. But I think the, the most pressing is the, the rising interest rates and the volatility on the effects side. Um, I think those pieces feed things tied to the forecast and feed things tied to the uh, data analytics piece. So that would be, my view, but again, let's uh, see what the audience says. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we close the poll and then we publish those results, data analytics is the one that continues to fascinate me. Um, I'm not expecting it to rank number one. And as you can see on the screen, it didn't. Um, it ranked second last. But it's one where it's sort of that, I don't want to say second choice, because in this case, it's the third choice, but or fourth choice. But it's one that it can it can support or help be the solution to dealing with cash forecasting as an example, or the mitigated impacts and vulnerability in your balance sheet and income statement from the fact that interest rates are rising and now we've got ex extra costs we gotta worry about, or this extra focus on how do you create cash from our cash reserves in a more efficient way. So there's a lot built into those. I don't think any of these are surprising, Dory, uh, unless there's something that jumped out to you as uh, unexpected. Yeah, the, the, the appropriate, right? They feed the cash forecast pretty much all the above. So it, it's it, it's what's focus on uh, reliability and timeliness, right? Always cash forecasting all the time. Makes sense. <laughs> the holy grail. <laughs> all right. Well, we will not prediction number one um, as we go into the next set of slides, but let's get into real-time treasury first. Knowing for all of you, the 72% that said, Cash forecasting was a big, big, big challenge. We'll get to cash forecasting. It's a later prediction. But I felt like real-time treasury might be one to get into first. Here's a small little table. The reason why I like this one, Dory, is because it shows that progression. Most organizations, I mean, you do a lot of work with organizations to help with their, we'll call it maturity model, and their cycle in terms of where they are right now versus where they would like to be. Uh, in executing business processes across everything, treasury payments, et cetera. So this is probably an unsurprising uh, to suggest that most organizations see themselves as in the automated. Maybe not for everything, but for many of those things. Would that be a fair statement, Dory? Absolutely. And what's interesting about 
this, Bob, is I've been in Treasury for well over 20 years from the practicing side, now on the consulting side. And that real-time scenario has always been top of mind, right? Information has always been needed real, in real time. You don't want your BAI or Swift file to feed three times a day. You want to see data in real time. Uh, and now that's possible, right? Now that's possible in, on cash management. Now that's possible with forecasting when you build APIs into your internal systems. It's also possible for payments. Now, not everybody needs real-time payments. In certain scenarios, it may not be necessary, but if it is a need that you have, it's available. Uh, the only thing we wish for and hope to get sometime in the near future is EBAM, but that's not technology's fault. That's more on regulations and what the banks are willing to do or not do uh, and what they want their compliance teams to adhere to or not adhere to. So, but in all aspects, this is the next phase of management within Treasury and finance, uh, the real time access to data, the data lakes, all the things that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, I put next in quotes intentionally because you're right, there's pieces of these that exist already. Most larger banks and quite a few smaller banks globally uh, through their APIs support real-time bank reporting. We have tons of clients that use that. The interesting part, and we have this debate, I mean, Dory, you and I have talked about it, but across a number of people on the Kriva side and even within our clients and our client advisory board is, what's the future of the prior day bank statement? Because right now what we're seeing is that we still see that BAI or XML, or uh, I was gonna say Swift, that's obviously being replaced by XML, but these types of prior day statements, which are very complete, very detailed, um, still exist. Whereas you have, it's the intraday reporting, like your first and second presentments being replaced by more stream of information. So the obsolescence in terms of intraday files um, is quite real. And you're being, you're seeing every single transaction as it happens, um, or at least have the opportunity to do that. But the prior day file, which a lot of processing, tagging, matching, reconciliation is based on, still continues to exist and probably will for the next while. There's a lot of our banking partners and integration partners. You know, we've done some press releases with several banks recently, and you know, we have these conversations with them about when that going to go away. And there's no great answer to when that's going to go away, except that. At some point, you won't need it when you have all of your transactions made available in real time and your whole back end processing starts to shift. That's the part that I find really interesting. And what we as treasury uh, industry should expect is that it's not just, OK, now I know what my cash is. It's now I have the ability to park. Uh, cash storage of value in real time um, you know the liquidity markets investment options you know being able to access whether it's t-bills or whether it's money market funds or pick your safe investment of choice those markets haven't quite reacted to where we see those on a real-time spendable basis if you will but that will come um, same thing on the funding side in terms of real-time payments I mean I think we probably both agree it's a matter of time before real-time payments are just payments and the word real-time or instant is dropped from the front because everything happens in real time in our personal world we expect this as consumers and users and we'll say holiday shoppers we expect instantaneous uh, movement of cash and anything that's delayed just seems frustrating and unnecessary in a b2b world i don't know what how many years and i do say in years till we just for, had this conversation about should we do a same day payment or a real time payment where that line simply goes away? But we're not there yet. And as a result, uh, there's a lot of organizations that if you look at the lower parts of payments, the bank account validation, suspicious and payment detection, like all that sort of stuff that we'll call it the processing, there are opportunities for that next step of process to catch up. You can still get your payment journey. And I'll go to the next slide to illustrate this. The, the governance part, the payment audit part, you're, there's still time to get this in real time. You should be doing all these things. I think, Dory, you wouldn't disagree with a, a moment of that. Um, you want your sanction list screening. You want your ability to detect good payment, bad payment with, say, machine learning or AI. You want your ability to look at does this bank account that I'm paying actually belong to the organization I think I'm paying in real time? You have time to get those more instant. Um, 
but it's probably not a tremendous amount of time if you're looking at any sort of instant payments, either domestically or globally. So there's a lot baked into that story, but yeah, to that's your kind point, of what we've seen on the payment side, where there's more emergence and use of instant and real time, we'll say, yeah. connectivity and communications. And to your point, Bob, right, as consumers are already doing this, whether it's through Zelle or Venmo, uh, other areas and Google Pay or Apple Pay, to each other, we're already doing this. It's just a matter of time to where this translates into corporate uh, bank account validation and you have a Zelle-like or Venmo-like thing for corporates and connectivity becomes uh, an afterthought. You're just using uh, digital confirmations and executing payments to uh, counterparties uh, in real time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's reasonable to assume that in 2023, we will see much more real time. Uh, real-time use uh, of data and then real-time application of data in your processes. One of the things that needs to change though is for technology, your tech stack that you use in Treasury and Finance to support this. So that means the adoption of APIs. APIs are important. Yes, you can do things like bank reporting without them and we have tons of clients that say, yeah, we don't need APIs just yet, just let's do it the normal way or the older way, which is fine. Like you can and some banks only support those. But if you think of APIs need to be connected to your internal data, your apps, which support your process, and they need to be connected to your, I'm gonna call it other systems that are outside treasury. Those other systems might be your banks, might be custodials, might be ERP, might be, let's say some sort of models, whether it's an external application or something else. APIs are basically the bridge that connects the data. If you want to push things over real time, you need an API. There's just no way around that. But that said, just having APIs, you can still do traditional types of integration and connectivity with those. APIs are the almost like the minimum. You decide what information you push back and forth across those bridges. But if you want to do things like, I don't know, even robotic process, machine learning, BI, like if you want to manage data in real time, you need APIs and you need all of your systems connected by APIs. We talked about the cash forecast, right? Uh, and nothing better than real-time access to actuals from the bank, as well as real-time access to your internal systems that feed that forecast. So you can, in real time, track the trending on your forecast, the variances on your forecast. Uh, are you running ahead or behind your targets from a cash flow management perspective? That's going to be key in 23, in particular, if you're looking at the cost of capital uh, and making sure that however you position the organization, both in the short term and the long term, is beneficial to the PNL uh, and doesn't put the company at risk uh, in any way of impacting the PNL. So that real time data is not just about your bank, it's about your internal systems, validations, and putting that into the forecast. Yeah, it's a unification of data across your enterprise, your enterprise being including your banking information. But you don't stop at the banks. Just because you got an API to your bank doesn't mean that you uh, don't need APIs everywhere else. You kind of do. Um, and that's kind of a nice segue into our next segment around AI because this concept of data is critical. You need data flowing around your organization. You need a data lake, a data warehouse, a data, oh gosh, I heard some reference. It was like a data lake cabin, <laughs> which I thought was pushing maybe the analogy a little too far. We'll just say you need your data in one place. Um, in order to it. for IT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> description. So I put up this slide. Anyone that's seen webinars that, that we've done, Dory, will be familiar with this one. There's a continuum of technologies out there. It goes from what I do not call artificial intelligence, by the way, rules-based automation, very programmatic. It doesn't learn the rules and the automation do not adapt based on the new information or new data that it collects. That's where you really get into pattern-based and knowledge-based. There's a lot of organizations out there that say AI this, AI that, because it's, well, you don't want to be left out and say you don't have AI, even if you're very programmatic. But the reality is, is that what we start to see is the cognitive, the ability to learn from data, either pattern-based, which is most of the machine learning that's out there, moving into knowledge-based, we don't see very much on the, I'm gonna call it the far continuum of deep learning and what we'll say academics and those technologists 
we'll call artificial intelligence. What we call artificial intelligence is really sits in the middle. If we look at where we were in 2022, most in treasury and then finance was at the green circle. We, a lot of rules-based automation masquerading as AI and a little bit of machine learning. So that's why I put the dot, let's say just somewhere in the middle. That said, could we be here, Dory, in terms of a movement to the right where we actually start to have data really drive much of our learning predictions and analysis in treasury? Is it going to play a bigger role than it did in 2022? It's an unanswerable yeah. question, but I'm going to ask it to you anyway. Yeah, uh, I think we could and we should. And here's here's why. Uh, there's there's things that you can control when it comes to your liquidity and there's things that you can't and the things you can control are on the payable side right you're in control of what goes out the door but what you can't control is what comes in the door that's on the receivable side um, you have terms you expect things to happen and this is where the AI piece is going to become very very critical for Treasury um, understanding the behaviors uh, of your you know, vendor basis paying you on the receivable side is going to be important uh, on the on the AI piece. Uh, it's also going to be important to inspect that not just by you know vendor, but also by entity, because you will ident you will be able to identify. I was able to identify in practice that different entities, even though they have the same per terms, are being paid differently by the same uh, OEM. So you have an opportunity with artificial intelligence to get more certainty on your receivable side. Um, and that's what's gonna help your forecast. That's what's gonna help you manage both in the short term and long term. And that's where I think AI is gonna play a critical piece Piece uh, is on the receivable side. I like the way you phrase that. Um, and you know, I think the same way, which is probably why we have fun in these webinars is because the receipt of cash, I want cash and I want it quicker and I want to have better predictability of when it's going to arrive so that I can find ways to speed it up, uh, which is, you know, similarly what we're talking about with real time. It's not real time payments that drive real time payments. It's receipt of real time payments that actually is going to drive that adoption. Same thing here. And I like your point on that is because we need more certainty to predict what those cash flows are going to look like. Based on history, what does that tell us? Based on what we saw last month, how does that change our outlook for our forecast for the next 13 or 26 weeks? And that need to be able to then action that information into some sort of meaningful plan, which might be, I need to actually incent my clients to pay us or I need to collateralize some of these receivables so I can actually get cash flow into my account at a relatively reasonable you know, fee or rate or something like that, just do something. Or maybe I just need to actually get into my revolver and make some, uh, we'll say adjustments so that my liquidity is back to the levels where I need it to be because what I'm seeing is that our clients are actually gonna pay us more slowly because of what the next six months looks like. These are all hypotheticals that need to be built into your cash forecast. AI can play that role, but it's gonna be, you're right, driven by the need to have certainty around your cash flow. It's that yeah. consistency of when am I getting paid and by who and making sure it's consistent throughout the organization. Yeah, exactly. We all want to be more precise and more predictive. AI can help that. But to do it, you need to understand what is going to be in place to help that AI work well. So this is my favorite slide, Dory. You know that because I love this. The reason why is because, A, it does two things. It distinguishes rubber duckies from stuffy rabbits in this case. I think we all know the difference, but the key to AI, even at its most basic, basic level, is to distinguish, hypothetically speaking, what is a duck, what is not a duck. And then when you feed it new inputs, like a picture of my dog, then you can distinguish that from a real live duck, which yes, is different looking than a rubber ducky. And it can make those predictions. You need data to train the models. And as a result, it's data that then drives new predictions about what that data is gonna look like. The common link here, Dory, and I think it, I said it probably three times in one sentence, data, data rules. You need that information 
and you need it to be somewhat organized uh, at its most basic level um, so that you can run these basic machine learning algorithms. What they look like is going to be something like this. Now, obviously, there's a fun GIF on the right side, but on the left side, here's the different use cases. How can I use that? A lot of organizations, when they're running payments, especially when those payments are getting faster, maybe not even fully instant, but certainly same day, then you're starting to see a need to ensure that you're protecting the integrity of those payments that you're paying the organizations or people that you think you are. So having more instant or quicker, faster fraud detection, AI plays a significant role in identifying those suspicious payments. You can train these models. Here's what our history of payments looks like. Here's what good payments looks like. And either hypothetically or maybe based on examples that might have happened to your organization, here's what bad ones look like figure out the difference based on the next set of data that you're looking at and be able to do that analysis instantly in real time. The forecasting, Dory, you just talked about that. So look at those past cash flows, look at the reconciliations, what happened when I thought they were, where did I have to then forecast again and again and again and keep modifying that so that next time I can realize this country, this region, this particular vendor or client, these are ones where the forecast ended up not being initially correct. We need to make adjustments. Let's let the AI project that in a different way. And that may be using data on your collection side, might be using data based on what procurement is telling you, might be extracting information from your SAP Oracle or Microsoft or whatever instances that you have for payables and receivables. But the whole point, Doria, and I think this is what you were saying before, is you want to establish better predictability in a higher confidence interval. Uh, if we all remember the stats class, confidence intervals, it's not just here's what we think is going to happen, it's how confident are we in that particular certainty. Those two things need to go together in areas like cash forecasting and planning. And I think the key is that last piece, Bob, which is the liquidity strategy. Right, because that's what's going to feed and have greater importance in 2023 as interest rates go up, which all indications are they're going to continue to go up. It's that working capital planning, risk management planning, whether it's risk management on the interest rate or the foreign currency volatility. It's going to be important to manage that reliably and timely because all of those insights impact the PL. And you're going to need to investigate opportunities for financing the organization that lower that interest cost, whether that's factoring, whether that's reverse factoring. Um, if you have the cash flow and you're not looking for exotic financing arrangements, you need to investigate dynamic discounting to try to improve your organization's margins and get uh, that gross margin higher, which is going to translate down to the bottom line ultimately in the end. So that working capital play, uh, the focus on EBITDA, the focus on return of invested capital to shareholders, growing your shareholder equity um, with what you have, that's going to be critical in 23. And that's that whole umbrella of liquidity planning, which I know we're going to get into in more detail later. Yeah, we will get into it because it, it, perme it, it kind of builds on everything we're talking about. But when it comes to forecasting, you want to make that actionable so you can start pulling whatever levers are appropriate to rebalance and recompose your balance sheet and your liquidity and income statement. So absolutely. There's a couple from a technology standpoint, I like to call them the eyes, uh, API, AI, BI. And these will help make that data actionable so that you can actually establish the confidence interval, put it at uh, the analysis, that dashboard in front of the CFO and say, yes, we have a high confidence interval that this is what our cash flow is going to look like. This is what's going to be free out of that cash flow. Here's what you can use for this next set of decisions and be able to pull those levers to either create more cash flow, improve your liquidity, be able to maybe cost effectively manage that balance sheet differently. So the eyes help make that happen. So that kind of leads us into our next prediction, Dory. We sort of alluded to it in a couple of different ways, this concept of liquidity planning. It's a, I hate to say practice area. I mean, I've used those words before, but it just sounds very formal. People are starting to take their cash forecast and do things with it. 
Why is that? It's because forecasting got a heck of a lot more difficult in 2022. Uh, one could argue it was very difficult in 2020 as the pandemic started to hit and suddenly we thought, oh, do we have enough liquidity to survive? How many days of survival do we have left unless we do something different? Um, that challenge never really went away. The practices we learned in 2020 certainly permeated through, but then we suddenly saw this confluence of rates and volatility and supply chain, blah, 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 all these different things basically led us to go, hmm, we need to stress this forecast in a variety of different ways. We need to apply these different risk scenarios. We need to actually make our forecast show what if this, so that we can start planning for what do we do about that. And I love this stat from IDC, 20% of leaders have a high confidence interval in their forecasts beyond just 30 days, which is not very much. It means 80% are, eh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know how, how confident I am that those numbers are really going to happen. The moment you expand those horizons up to three months, it drops to 5%. Uh, and this was not just Treasury. This was CFOs and FP&A that were part of this particular survey. Everyone is saying the forecast needs to be better. Part of that, Dory, is this fun slide. Um, I used this in a forecasting webinar a couple weeks ago, and I like it a lot because it really shows that there is a confluence or maybe a collaboration that needs to start happening where that time horizon, not that liquidity plan is just about time horizons, but that time horizon where we need to forecast bottoms up, further out. And FP&A, who typically does a tops down version, they take things and they start backing out data points to come to a free cash flow number, needs to start making a bit more precise so that that free cash flow guidance for the next quarter, next two quarters, the remainder of the calendar year, needs to come at a better level of precision so that CFOs and CEOs, when they're talking about these numbers, uh, are able to feel very confident that these are the numbers that are going to happen based on this set of market conditions. But there's a lot built into that, Dory. Yeah, and I love this slide too, because it's like cash forecasts need liquidity planning. They are different, right? Cash forecasts, as you and I have had conversations about this, Bob, is like source and use, right? Source of cash, use of cash, what's remaining at the end of the day uh, to make decisions on. What's really important in liquidity planning, and I know you're going to get into it, is that horizon, that time frame, and that certainty on that on that horizon to really plan out not just full debt and investments, but full blown uh, cash flow, working capital, DSO, DF, DPO considerations, uh, and being able to put those in scenario models and see the potential impact. That's going to be key. Yeah, it is. And, and I like the way you phrase that because we all know what cash management is. You know, it's today. It's it's positioning reconciliation. To your point, the cash forecast has always been and still is um, tomorrow and however many days, weeks, months, years uh, beyond tomorrow that you care to project forward. Typically, it's much more operational cash, but there's this need to be able to turn that operational cash. What's my, as you say, sources and uses and those sources are going to be across the organization. Maybe there's external factors. Uh, there's a variety of, we'll just say, things that you need to bring together, data elements, to be able to bring that um, as a confident forecast that we can feel good about pushing forward. But it's still a projected cash balance for some point in the future. Here's how much cash we think we will have at X period of time. Liquidity planning, uh, this, you can see the time horizon is the same. We're still looking forward, but our objective is a little bit different. That objective is to optimize liquidity decisions. It's to basically action that forecast. Now I know what my expected cash balance is going to be, then what? And the then what is I need to do something about it. So I'm surrounding that forecast with more data, more analytics, such as investments, such as borrowing, such as working capital, there's a variety, there's more than I can type on the slide. You're surrounding it with data to make more optimal decisions about your overall liquidity across the enterprise. And that's the difference. It's the not the time horizon between forecast and planning. They're both forward. It's the what is it, uh, what outcome am I looking for, which is to understand, do I have sufficient liquidity to do X, Y, and Z, which could be buybacks. It could be paying back debt. 
because maybe I have long-term debt that is a lower interest rate than today and suddenly it's at a discount and I want to take advantage of that. Maybe it's more proactively managing working capital, working with procurement to say, why aren't we monetizing our supply chain? Why are we not taking advantage of opportunities or creating opportunities to unlock and, and free up cash flow just by paying our vendors in different ways and different programs? Same thing on the receivable side, um, making sure their balance sheet and income statement and cash flows are protected from whatever currency volatility will continue to permeate into 2023. That's that liquidity or that's that practice of liquidity planning. And I think the key here, Bob, is historically solutions are focused just on cash forecasting. And the liquidity planning has been done outside of a platform. Mm, good point. Right? So those those decisions and those, that planning has been done outside of a platform. Now you have an opportunity in 2023 to do that within a platform, single source of truth, single source of truth to help you reliably and timely inform different scenarios and the impact of those scenarios for management in times of volatility that we just talked about in times of uncertainty that's going to be important to make those data-driven decisions yeah it really is and i mean you can see the list for yourself there's a lot of outcomes but you're right is that these are practices that were done by different parts of the organization or sometimes with liquidity planning not really done as much at all and they certainly were done in different places, so you did not have the data working together. They were typically all done in, wait for it, for prediction number four, look at a click to make that happen, spreadsheets. <laughs> so <laughs> as we talk, as we, I'm not gonna leave the, the discussion about cash forecasting and planning alone, but in that context, is this the year that where we want to get better at forecasting, where we want to get more precise about liquidity planning, where we want to give actions to the CFO and to FP&A to say, here's the kind of things we need to be doing to meet these, these targets that have been set financially for the organization. Can we do this analysis outside of spreadsheets? So here is the reasons why you use spreadsheets. Obviously, you could probably you could have a whole webinar on why do you use spreadsheet story? And we would probably come up with, I would say, hmm, 20, 30 different reasons, easily, without even trying too hard. Here's the top five. Um, this is actually based on some polls and surveys we did with organizations that don't, that do and don't use treasury technology. These were the top five that they came up with. And based on a, a glance story, they kind of seem about right, don't they? Like nothing that any of us have heard before, even from our own clients, where they're saying, hey, I'd really like to, you know, let's just say, use the TMS for cash forecasting, but dot, dot, yeah. dot, I need something that we used to do in spreadsheet that's just not so possible in an automated system that was built some number of years ago. Uh, I think we're getting close to that possible though. Uh, I think oh, we do, we that's a foreshadow to the next slide, Dory. <laughs> we're getting close to that possible, and I think we will be doing a webinar here in 2023 about the risks, the top five risks of relying solely on, on spreadsheets. And I think everyone in the audience can attest to different nightmare scenarios that have kept them up at night uh, as a result of a formula error or a macro breakdown or some horrible file becoming corrupt and all of a sudden what you relied on uh, is broken and you have to rebuild it from scratch. So all those scenarios um, are things that should get minimized in 23. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, yes. I absolutely think so. But everyone in the audience is looking at this going, yeah, that's the reason why I use spreadsheets. <laughs> because of those things, it's just easier to use or it's actually not necessarily easier to use, but it's a heck of a lot more flexible because I can just drag it over here and create a new tab or I can create a custom roll up, whatever your scenario, we get it. And in fact, uh, in the webinar we did just a week ago, uh, we pulled like several hundred different uh, attendees and the results are at the top. 12% said, no, no, spreadsheets are amazing. I'm paraphrasing when I say that, they didn't use those words. But they did say they want to rely on spreadsheets as the primary forecasting tool. 88% are like, no, no way do I want to use, do I want to. Now, want to is intention. Ability to do that is different, Dory, and that's what we're gonna get into. But intention is, I'd like to get away from that because what you said about the challenges of spreadsheets, I don't think anybody disputes that. 
uh, maybe 12% say, no, nah, it's okay, we can make do with it. We're not worried about the controls or the issues or the macro errors, blah, blah, blah. But 88% said, Excel or whatever spreadsheet you might use, we need to use that less when it comes to forecasting. The third one, 0%, and this is comes with an asterisk because this is not a scientific number. This is an observed number based on our experience. No one's been able to use, eliminate spreadsheets completely. And that's the challenge story, is that why? What, is, what does a system need to do to be able to meet that need? What we looked at, because we asked ourselves the same question. I mean, we had clients that were using Excel. I mean, like they, they really wanted to use uh, you know, a system for more, but they found that there was something there that made it a lot easier to use in spreadsheet. So we looked at that. We addressed that problem. Um, and we did a press release back at AFP about it, not to make it a Creva-centric or product-centric webinar. There's no intention to do that. But here was the features that organizations, whether they use TMS or they use Excel or whether they use both, uh, were very interested in. You can read the bullet points. As flexible as a spreadsheet. Hmm, interesting point. I like that one. Uh, similar to the other one on the top right, Excel like entry with copy and paste. That's a quote, by the way, from someone that said, this is what I need. Make it look like that. And I'm interested. Um, just the ability to copy paste. Like I have a bunch of things here. I don't want to have to double click, enter a number one at a time. I just want to say, oh, that number says 12 million. Hmm. I think 13 is better. Type, 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 make it happen. That's the sort of controls. We're all used to it. That's why we use spreadsheets because it's super easy. So those were top requested features. The ones that I think, Dory, are a bit more interesting, you see down the left side, the multiple and parallel forecasts, and not as, a, not as the same thing, but as something different, the ability to have what-if scenarios on each of those multiple forecasts. That's become, especially this year, really, really important, Dory. It is important, and I don't think, like, I actually agree wholeheartedly. You can minimize as much as possible the utilization of spreadsheets, but it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it. Where I think is going to be interesting is where technology meets spreadsheets and those APIs that we talked about earlier feed your spreadsheet so that you're not doing manual data entry. So to make it uh, more reliable uh, and less prone to error uh, and less corruptible. I think, I think that's where we're headed next is the ability to basically automate your spreadsheet so you can feel more comfortable with technology and more familiar in the tool that you're used to using day in and day out. Yeah, the prediction here is yes, it is possible. Um, it's just a matter of having a forecasting tool that is built to do all these things. If your forecasting tool doesn't have these features, you're gonna be in part of that 0%. Like, can't get rid of my spreadsheet. I can you know, import it or something like that and go through some process, but that's not what people are looking for. People are looking for just make it easy, make sure that I can design it with the categories and the roll-ups and the summaries and the targets, just make it look and act like my spreadsheet and I'll happily use your tool is what everyone says. So the prediction is it is possible. Uh, definitely possible. And I mean, we committed two years to figure out how to do that for our clients because we saw too many people that say, I'd really like to, but dot, dot, dot. So I think it's very important and I'm glad that, uh, I'm sure there's other tools out there that do the same thing. I can't speak to those except to say, yes, it is possible should you want to be part of that 88% to lessen the role of spreadsheets and forecasting and other parts of your treasury and planning. The key is maintaining that look and feel that you're used to, right? That that spreadsheet that just makes you happy <laughs> for some reason or yeah, other. Exactly. Why would you want to give up what works? All you're trying to do is improve it. I don't know anyone that's come to a TMS and said, I want to throw away every single thing that I've done. I mean, obviously, you kind of know I should transform process as well as just automate. But most people say, I just want to make, I have this, it works but I'd like to make it a little bit more pick your improvement, more accurate, more refined, uh, more inclusive from a variety of different people within the organization to contribute. I'd like to be able to unify it in better time. I'd like to be able to predict, not predict, sorry, reconcile and then uh, understand the accuracy of that variances so I can actually communicate those back to the sources and organizations 
right, if the organization, these departments that actually contribute that forecast. These are what typically conversations look like. The, the conversation never was, can you please completely change my forecast and the way my CFO got to see that every single week? Because that would be great. No one says that. So as a result, this was a core need that we identified early on. And no one, I'm sure, in this webinar will say, no, that's a terrible idea. Don't waste your time doing that. We're happy to just change everything. Our CFO is incredibly flexible in the way that they want to look at the forecast day in and day out. Mildly tongue-in-cheek there, Dory, but I think we all understand each other. Feel free to ask questions, by the way, if you want to drill down on that. So we're going to ask you a question, though, before we get into our last prediction around value engineering. Of all the things we talked about so far, what are you expecting to leverage more of in 2023? APIs and real time. Um, some will say, I would like to, but I'm not expecting to. So that's why I wrote it this way. What are you expecting? to leverage more of. APIs in real time, artificial intelligence or machine learning, which is part of that family, less Excel. I don't want to lead the audience in answering, but that's my favorite. Uh, liquidity planning or nothing. Everything we did in 2022 is perfect and we will maintain the status quo for 2023. So Dory, any predictions from you? How would you answer that question, Dory, as we give the audience 10 more seconds to respond? I, and like you, Bob, I would go with uh, either less Excel or liquidity planning. Um, that That's going to be important. And th I think that's where it's, it's going to lead. But let's see what the audience says. Hopefully, nobody says status quo. Because if you're planning on status quo for 2023, then you're going to be uh, in a whole heap of pain. What we talked about, you know, data integrity and operation resilience and cost cutting and things like that. Status quo is not going to work. They might not, but there's no shame in saying yes to all of those, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, let's uh, close the poll and publish the results. I am going to predict that, yes, less Excel. Ooh, tied for first. Less Excel and APIs. Oh, look at that. Well, that's okay. I feel like we tipped the audience, though, in saying less Excel. Nonetheless, there's definitely a good reason to believe in each of these. I mean, if you look at APIs, uh, just look at my other screen to see the poll. APIs in real-time process, there's a lot of progress that was made in 2022. Most banks are either uh, piloting in market or in development with some sort of API for some or all of their treasury and cash management services. Um, a lot of it starts with payments, some of it culminates in real-time bank reporting. More will happen. We will start to see that FOMO effect. As we start, as an example, do press releases with banks, every time we do one, there's a bunch of other banks that say, oh, wait a second, we can do that too. And uh, so that's a good thing. Um, and it shows that there's enthusiasm and passion to basically make this a reality for all of us because it's really important. AI, not surprising. I think there's, I think there's a lot of value in AI, but it's hard to expect that that's going to materialize based on the lack of progression so far. It's been a periphery technology that's unsurprising. Everyone that said le yes or less Excel, high five, right, Dory, to number C? Right. I think a lot, a lot of the AI numbers, because it did surprise me as well, Bob, I think a lot of it is that trust issue, right? It's so new. And how do you trust it? How long do you have to run parallel before you trust it? I think that's, that's what potentially uh, could be driving that number down. I buy into it. I mean, I, I like it. I like to see more progress, but the closed model approach, I think is a, that's a definite inhibitor. There needs to be a lot of work here by you know treasury system vendors, by app vendors that integrate into those, become part of those marketplaces. There's just a lot of work that needs to happen for us to find meaningful use cases that can be improved with AI. So buy that, but I love less Excel and the idea of liquidity planning. I mean, everyone's been doing that already. So the fact that everyone's, not everyone, but 41% are saying, yep, more of that, those are all good things. But none of this really happens, Dory, unless this next prediction comes true, which is value engineering. So playful, obviously, uh, GIF that's brought in here. Uh, there we go. Thank you for closing the poll. Playful GIF, but I think we all understand that there's, it's not like our budgets are going to increase dramatically year over year. In fact, it's probably
probably the opposite based on most indications for most organizations. So that's a yeah. big, that's setting you up, Dory, to say yes. <laughs> and yes. here's how we can help you. <laughs> We're getting to my favorite part, right? We all want those things. We all want APIs. We all want real time. We all want to use Excel less. We all want uh, to fix our forecast and get those payments uh, encrypted and systematically workload and do the whole EBAM thing and the automated reconciliation and so on and so forth. We all want those things, but guess what? Budgets are tight. <laughs> Budgets are going to get tighter in 23, right? We talked about the potential for recession. We talked about costs going up, cost of capital going up. There's still inflation here. And it's a global problem. It's not just isolated to North America. It's a global problem. So budgets are going to be tight. How do you combat that? How do you get your project to the top of the list? And that is value engineering. Because value engineering is going to help you answer three fundamental questions. That's what's going to help you get prioritized for your project over other departments that are going to, CF, to the CFO and getting them asking them to sign off on a particular project. You need to come prepared. You need to come prepared of answering the question of what needs to change. Looking at your current process, where it falls on a maturity scale currently and where does it need to be in, to grow into different areas of the maturity scale? How do you compare to your peers in, in your space and your revenue profile from a benchmarking perspective and what they're doing? So once you identify the gaps of current state, what is your current practice and what does best practice look like and what steps you need to take to get to that best practice. You need to also let your CFO know what is the business impact of affecting that change, meaning what's the return on investment? What is the organization going to get out of it from impacting currency volatility? What is the organization going to get out of it from impacting margins on the P&L? Because if costs need to be cut, why should I invest in your solution and what is that going to benefit the company with in terms of bottom line impact? That's the why change. And the last piece, you need to come prepared to answer why is it important now? And that's looking at the risk of the status quo. So if we don't do anything, what is the implication for the organization? This is more on the qualitative side, but it's also typically what moves the needle? Because if you think about it, when you're buying technology, you're going to get an ROI, right? Technology is there to give you efficiencies. Technology is there to give you visibility, uh, better controls. So there, there's a, going to be an ROI there. The important piece is why is now the right time? So what's the risk of the status quo? What are the implications to the organization? And typically, those risks are both reputational impact as well as bottom line impact. So, for example, if you're looking to do payment hubs, centralize your, your payments, well, the risk of not doing anything is in particular if you're not encrypted, in particular if you're operating in disparate uh, bank portals or disparate systems, well, the risk is for the potential for fraud. The risk is you're exposed to cybersecurity implications. So that's a reputational impact for the organization. If you're looking to improve your forecast, well, the risk of not doing anything has the potential for bottom line impact. We talked about the cost of capital going up. We talked about currency volatility. If you don't have certainty in those areas, there's downstream impact to the organization from the bottom line, and those swings could be substantial. So that last piece, that why now, a qualitative answer to the CFO of why it's important right now is equally as critical as the ROI, because that's what gets the needle moving. That's what gets the attention of the CFO is we are at risk from an operational perspective, as well as a financial resiliency perspective, if we don't action this project. The last piece, if you can go to the next slide, is framing it in terms of where it fits within the strategy of the organization. So it's great that you've identified what you want to change. It's great that, you've, that it comes with an ROI and you've highlighted the risk, but in the overall scheme of the organization from a strategy perspective, where does the, your project have an impact? You have to highlight those things. You have to be able to clearly articulate 
from an organizational strategy perspective, what does your platform enable? Where does it fit in that organization strategy so that not only are you articulating to your CFO the impact, but also that you are in line with their corporate objectives. You're, and you're here to make sure that you enable their corporate objectives. I think you'd agree with me, Bob, that all of these things are gonna be critical to articulate the right way to get your project funded so that you meet those predictions that we talked about earlier in terms of getting the best of breed technology in-house so that you're able to provide those reliable real-time insights that are needed in 2023. Yeah, the best way, uh, is it a conversation I had at AFP a couple months ago at the conference, and it was equating this competing for budget dollars to an episode of Shark Tank. And that's a very American <laughs> reference for, for those uh, that are uh, listening in overseas. It's that they're all good ideas in terms of how to either maintain the technology you have or in, increase that investment in technology that many people in the surveys we've done said they need to do. And yet, not every idea is going to get funded. And it's the exact same thing as that TV show, uh, that you really want to ensure that your project stands out in terms of its impact to the value of the organization. So well said, Dorian, thank you for saying that. So we're literally at time, uh, which means we'll answer your questions offline, but final thoughts, invest in technology to repurpose time. There's no badge of honor in being busy. Make sure your time is well spent. You are going to have less of it next year. You might as well spend it doing the important things like analyzing rather than putting together a forecast, for example. Cash forecast and liquidity planning, different things, but interrelated, one builds on the other the real time. So we have some of these technologies, they exist. Are they utilized? Mm, not as much, but they will be in 2023. Be ready, have your processes ready for what's next to capitalize on that availability of instant and real time information. And the last part, and this is really what you just finished on Dory, your impact is measurable. So don't be shy about showing the impact of what your transformation, what your improvements can do, not just for Treasury, but for the wider organization. Treasury has a much greater impact that's been proven um, through the, the pandemic and certainly since then. It's a matter of make sure that that is captured well so that you can prove here's what we can do for our organization if you just give us that opportunity. So with that, I will say thank you very much. I do see a stream of questions coming in. I apologize that we couldn't answer them online, but we will respond to each and every one offline, including those that want to see the slides. Um, we will happily share those with you as a follow-up for those that are just loving that PowerPoint so much that they want it all for themselves. Dory, thank you for your contribution as always. Super fun to be with you. I'm sorry we forgot our holiday hats and Santa gear, <laughs> but Next time, even if it's in January, I will fulfill that promise and wear a Christmas hat. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you guys joining and taking time out of your busy day to hear Bob and I and our thoughts. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Have a good one.